two verses that I want to share with you that simple verses from Scripture that could rock our world. If we really believed them, if we really put them into practice, if we really let them sink into our hearts and into our spirits, I believe these two verses could revolutionize our homes, our communities, our nation, and our world. And the first one is Acts 10, verse 38. We have Bibles at the back if any of you'd like to uh, grab one and follow along. The first one is Acts 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, blessing others, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the enemy. And then the second one is John 14, verse 12, where Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, I tell you the truth, if anyone believes in me, the works that I am doing, you will do also. And even greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. Holy Spirit, I ask that you open our eyes today to the beautiful circle of blessing that you have invited us into. I thank you, Lord, that you have created us for your good pleasure. And I thank you, Lord, that you have invited us to be a part of your kingdom, a kingdom that is forever, a kingdom that is uh, unshakable and is eternal. And I pray today, Lord, that our hearts will be challenged to take the blessings and receive the blessings that you have given us and in turn bless others. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. I have to tell you, uh, be perfectly honest with you and be real with you today that when I first heard about the sermon series coming up and Tom had asked me if I would be a part of it, I was a little bit underwhelmed with what I was going to be teaching. I was, in fact, I can almost imagine the conversation at your breakfast tables this morning. Uh, well, honey, let's dress the kids, let's bust through some snow drifts and let's go down the slick roads and hear a diesel mechanic talking about blessing others. <laughs> yeah, let's do that, let's, that sounds exciting. And, and, uh, and then Tom told me my, uh, my sermon topic today was going to be blessing basics. And I thought, well, that's about like teaching on the fundamentals of track and field. <laughs> what are we going to do today? How are you going to run? Oh, okay. Going to run some more. Going to run till it hurts. That's what we do. That, that, that's what we do to, in, in track and field. Those are the fundamentals. Well, the basics of blessing, you know, we bless. We're, we're supposed to bless. We've sung the song ever since we were kids. Make me a blessing, O Savior, I pray. I can't even get the tune right. But you remember those, those songs and, and how we were taught to bless others. We all know about it. It's all standard stuff. It's ritual. It's, it's basics. It's, it's fundamentals of Christianity that we bless others just as we have been blessed. And I have to confess that my heart wasn't really into this for a short time. And then on Thursday, Holy Spirit showed up for me with these two verses of scripture that I've just given to you this morning. And God began to open up for me an excitement. And I got to tell you, I'm pumped today. I'm excited today about talking about God's blessing in our lives and how we can spread his blessing to others. This is going to be an exciting series where we put into practice, where the rubber meets the road, and we expand God's kingdom by blessing others. One of the, um, uh, I want to go back to those two verses, Acts 10, 38. And I want to tell you how this verse, it's one that I've known all my life. Peter was preaching to the house of Cornelius, and uh, he had just had a vision. The Holy Spirit showed up to him too, because he wasn't too excited about what he was going to be doing. And the Holy Spirit showed up and gave him a vision of the, all the animals on the white sheet, and they were unclean animals, and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, Not so, Lord, not, never has anything common or unclean entered into my mouth. And three times the Holy Spirit showed him this picture, and three times Peter said, No, I don't want to go. And then the voice from, the, from heaven said to him, Peter, what God has cleansed, don't you call common. I want you to bless the house of Cornelius. This Gentile house of Cornelius, I want you to bless them with the gospel. And in that teaching, he said these words describing the ministry of Jesus in Acts 10, 38, how, Jesus, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. 
And that just stopped me in my tracks this week as I was praying because I realized that the humanity of Jesus in that verse, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Do you realize that everything that Jesus did while he was here on earth, he did it in the weakness of human flesh? He did it as the son of man? We've grown up thinking, well, he was the son of God. He could turn the water into wine. He could raise Lazarus from the dead. He could heal the, the lepers. He could cleanse. He could do all this stuff because he was the son of God, right? No. That verse says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. This person who was in total human form, who experienced every temptation that we experience today, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, they were just as real in his world as they are in yours and mine. And yet God anointed him with what? The Holy Spirit and with power. Guess what it says in Acts 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. You will bless the world. You see, this very human man, Jesus Christ, in the form of human flesh, read Philippians chapter 2, he laid everything aside of his heavenly, of his heavenly uh, persona and became like us. And in that form, God anointed him with the Holy Spirit. And then it says that he went about doing good blessing others, and healing all who were oppressed of the enemy. When that settled into my spirit this week, I started to get excited about blessing others. Because, quite frankly, most days I don't feel like I've got it in me. <laughs> I, my own life is kind of a mess some days. Anybody identify with that? You don't have to raise your hand. You, you know what I'm talking about. My life's a little bit of a mess. How can I bless others? And yet God anoints us. He blesses us. He overflows. An anointing is, a, is an overflowing of his Holy Spirit in our lives. And in turn, we can, we can bless others. And that brings us to that second verse when Jesus told his disciples, If anyone believes in me, what I have been doing, you will, be do you will do also. As he is going about doing good and blessing others, he said, you're going to do the very same thing if you believe in me, and greater things than these shall you do. Why? Because I go to the Father. That always confused me when I used to read that. How could it be good for him to go away and then leave us with this job to do here down here? Well, you, heard, you read the rest of John 14, and you'll find out the reason it's good is he said, if I don't go away, I can't send the Holy Spirit to you. So church, I want you to understand, first and foremost, the very basics of blessing today is that we need to be connected by the Holy Spirit, have his anointing in our lives, and then blessing is going to become a natural way of life for us. Okay, I've already preached my sermon in five minutes. We can all go home, but I've got a few more things to say before we close today. I want to give you two initiatives for blessing others. As, kingdoms, as king's kids, as children of the king, we are authorized to bless. We have the authority to bless others. One of the scriptures that the ministry team has given us uh, is in Matthew 22, uh, or 28, the Great Commission, where Jesus is sending his disciples out. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. We have been authorized by the king of kings to give his word and to give his blessing around us as children of the king. Uh, the Bible, uh, God told Abraham back in Genesis, he said, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And you and I, having been grafted into Abraham's family, into God's family, we now have been authorized to bless others. God has placed you in that place of employment. God has placed you in that place of ministry. God has placed you in your family to bless others. That's why we are here. If it was any different, he'd have just raptured us up to heaven right to begin with. But no, he left us here to bless and to change our culture with the good news and with the blessing of grace and of the Holy Spirit. The second initiative for blessing others, as spirit-filled believers, we are empowered to bless. I want you to turn, if you would, to John chapter 20, because this is a very important little segment here that Jesus told his disciples just before he went back to heaven. 
We're going to read verses 21 and 22 of John chapter 20. I'll begin reading with verse 19 of John chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Remember that verse we uh, spoke of just a little bit ago, how Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the, of the enemy? Jesus is now authorizing us. He's saying, now, just as the Father has sent me in human flesh, now I'm sending you in all of your weakness, in all of your inadequacies, I'm sending you to do the same. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Now, that would be scary in and of itself unless we read the next verse. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Church, unless we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, we're nothing more than a club wasting time and wasting money. But when the Holy Spirit comes and anoints his people to bless, we become a culture changer. We become world changers. We become the kind of people that was, were described in the book of Acts. Those that have turned the world upside down have come here too. I remember seeing a t-shirt that somebody wore. They, they, their church made t-shirts and it said on the front, oh, that church. <laughs> I thought that, that'd be a pretty cool t-shirt to have, wouldn't it? Those people, those radicals that have, that have changed their culture. That's us if we have the anointing of God upon us. Like I said, otherwise, we're wasting people's time and money. Lord, breathe on us. Like the song we sang, bring in that rushing mighty wind to baptize us, to anoint us, so that just as Jesus, who was anointed from God on high, we can go about blessing others and healing all who are oppressed of the enemy. And they're everywhere. They're in our own homes. They're in our own communities. All of us suffer from this oppression from time to time. And you know what it feels like to have somebody come and give you a word of blessing. Breathing life into a dead soul. Breathing life into a barren place. That's what blessing is all about. I want to give you two ways that we can bless. And one of the definitions that uh, the book that we've been reading called, uh, help me out, Tom. The book that we're reading... Uh, about, I'm sorry, <laughs> he, he, I caught him flat-footed just like I am. Um, surprise your world, thank you. Surprise your world. This is kind of a, a backdrop for where we're going this, uh, this series. And one of the definitions that I love in that book is this, to bless is to add strength to another's arms. To bless is to add strength to another's arms. And the, the word, the scripture picture that I would give you that is, is of Aaron and Hur, the two brothers who uh, came alongside Moses when, when the, they were at the, in the battle and, and the enemy was winning. And then when Moses would raise his hands, the, uh, the, the Israelites would win. And so these two, Aaron and Hur, came beside him and lifted up his arms in the battle so that they could win. And that's, that's kind of the picture that I get when I see this, to add strength to another's arm. You, it is such a blessing when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death to have somebody come alongside and lift your arm in the battle. Or when you're walking through a financial hardship to have somebody come alongside and lift your arm so that you can go through that battle victoriously. That's what adding uh, strength to another's arms, that's what blessing means. Two ways that we can bless. The first one is this, words of healing and affirmation. Words of healing, and not just words, okay? We're going to talk about this in a little bit. Not just empty compliments. I think it was Mark Twain who once said, I could live for two months on one good compliment. <laughs> He's one of my favorite philosophers. <laughs> could live for two months on one good compliment. But you know what? If you're one of those people that kind of thrive on affirmation, I'm kind of one of those. I like a pat on the back once in a while. I like a, boy, you did good. 
but you know what? It runs out. <laughs> At the end of the week, I got to do it all over again, and I might not get the affirmation this time. And, and uh, so it isn't just about words where we come alongside and try to cheer some up with our words. Those are all, that's all good. But we're talking about Holy Spirit words of affirmation and blessing and healing to where we are listening to the Holy Spirit and at the same time we are listening to the hearts of the people around us and we hear that hurt that's there and the Holy Spirit gives us a simple word that says, hey, can I give you a real uh, kind of an unusual example? When our boys were small, uh, they were in a car accident, quite severe one, both thrown from the vehicle. It was a miracle they weren't, their lives weren't taken at that time. But uh, our youngest son uh, began to suffer nightmares after that. And he would wake up at just blood-curdling screams in the middle of the night after this accident. And we, as parents, we didn't know what to do with it. We would pray before we went to bed, and, and uh, he'd go to sleep. And about halfway through the night, he'd wake up screaming. And, and uh, I understood why, but we just didn't have an answer for it. And uh, my wife was talking to one of the ladies in the church, one of the elderly saints, and tell, she said, I'd really like you to pray with us about this because we don't know what to do. And, and uh, this, this lady came to my wife about two weeks later and she said, you know, the Holy Spirit told me something. She said, the Holy Spirit told me that you need to, to get a flashlight for Joel. Just give him a flashlight and let him take it to bed with him and put it on the nightstand. And the Holy Spirit told me he'll be all right. Now, that's good, practical, Holy Spirit wisdom, right? So that day, we went out and bought a flashlight. We said, here, Joel, you can take this to bed with you. If you're scared, it's always right there. You can just flip the light on. You know what? He never had a nightmare after that to this day. <laughs> now, you say, is that a coincidence? No. That was a Holy Spirit moment when God spoke to a, she was in her 90s, if I remember right, this little old lady who came to us and said, hey, the Holy Spirit has a word for me, for you. See, that's words of healing words of affirmation, words that bring hope. And that's what we need to have more of, listening to the Holy Spirit and then sharing. The second way is acts of kindness and generosity. And let me say something about this. These, these ways that we can bless, words of healing and affirmation and acts of kindness and generosity aren't man, are to manipulate people, not to bring people to a desired end, not so that we can get them saved and then the family of God. No, it's just because. Just because God has blessed us. Just because God has blessed me, I want to bless someone else. Not because there's something in it for me, not so that I can say, oh, look what I did, but just because. Just like John 3, 16, God so loved that he gave. Not for anything in return, he just gave. Can we be people like that who give anonymously even without having to have your name Scribe somewhere for your giving. Let's bless people anonymously. Let's bless people just because we've been blessed. I want to share two real quick stories, if I could, today, and uh, about their high school stories. And just ways that, that taught me how God uses us to bless others in some pretty unusual ways. The first one uh, was a fellow, <clears throat> I'll just call him Tim. That wasn't his real name, but Tim was a kind of a socially awkward boy in, in school. He was a couple years younger than me in high school. He had a tough life at home, I, I learned later, uh, with his father. Just, and he was just very socially awkward, I'll, I'll, I'll put it that way. And as a senior in high school or a junior, I can't remember what, a year, what year it was, I just felt like the Lord was prompting me to be a friend to this guy, to Tim. How many of you know in high school, when you want to be popular, you want to hang out with the popular kids, right? It's what you do. And instead, God was speaking to me to, to come alongside this kid. And besides that, he rode on my school bus, and we had time to talk. So I started to listen to Tim and to his story. And, and, uh, and finally, I had this point of decision. God was, I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, you need to invite him to come to your youth group, okay? I didn't want to. That was my space. You know, I didn't want him. I was with him on the bus. I was with him at school. He was hanging around with me at school. He was hanging around with me at the bus. I could go to church and there I could be by myself. And I didn't want to do this. But I, I kept feeling this prompting. You need to invite Tim. So 
I invited Tim to youth group, and wouldn't you know it, he gave his heart to Jesus at one of the meetings, and little by little, Tim began to change. He began to gain confidence in himself and in his God. He began to get involved in a, in a bus ministry that we had. He joined the Bible quiz team. And God was just doing some really neat things in, in Tim's life. Well, uh, years later, he moved out of state. He got married. He had two daughters who have turned out to be brilliant people. He went on to be successful in ministry and also as in, in the insurance business. And he had two brilliant daughters, both with doctorate degrees, one in medicine and one in political science. One of them worked in the uh, W. Bush campaign and, and worked for him as a staffer. And just a, an incredible success of what God had done in his life. And about five years ago, and this is, I talk, talked earlier about the circu circle, uh, circular uh, reciprocal effect of uh, blessing. About five years ago, I got a card in the mail. I hadn't seen him for years. Got a card in the mail from Tim. Says, hey, Phil, I heard you were in a tough spot. He said, I wanted to send you this. It was a check for $2,000. And he said, Phil, if you hadn't told me about Jesus and been Jesus to me in my life, I'd have never been where I am today. Now, that's not to say anything about what I did. I was just trying to be obedient and I was doing a kind of a poor job of it at that. My motives weren't always right, but God used that whole situation to bring about a circular, a reciprocal act of blessing where I gave words of affirmation and he in turn blessed in my time of need. See, if the body of Christ could be operating like this, what a beautiful thing it could be. And then one more quick story and then we'll move toward the close. This other fellow in high school, his name was Ron. He was the guy I was jealous of. <clears throat> all the girls followed Rod around all the school. He was a popular guy. He was good looking. He had a, he had a 1969 orange Roadrunner and uh, a 383 in it. And I had a 63 Rambler four-door ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> I was jealous of Ron. And, <clears throat> and to top it all off, the girl that I wanted to date, he started dating. And... Uh, and so there was a little tension, let's just put it that way. You know how that, those high school years are and all that dating stuff. And, and uh, one, time, one day his girlfriend, the one that I wanted to date, came up to me and says, Phil, I said, I want you to talk to Ron about Jesus. Now, <laughs> my motives were terrible. I didn't care if Ron knew about Jesus, but I thought maybe I could gain brownie points with this girl. <laughs> so I said, okay, I can do that. So we arranged it. We arranged a time to meet, and, and uh, we, we sat in the top row of the bleachers in the gym at North Mahaska High School, and I was going to tell him about Jesus, and I want to tell you if anybody ever bombed at sharing the gospel, it was me that day. My motives were bad. I really didn't want to be there, and, and somehow I, I, I went through this process of, of, of we were all sinners, you know, the Romans road to salvation, and I, I probably had all those things all mixed together to where it didn't make a lick of sense to anybody. <clears throat> and I walked away from there thinking, that'll never have any effect. Well, a couple years later, by the way, he didn't marry her, I didn't either. We both went our own ways, and Ron hit a hard spot, hit a tough spot. And the seed that had been sown in weakness... <laughs> And even in bad motives and all of the things that were going along about then, envy and all that stuff, the seeds that were sown found soil in his heart and he gave his life to Christ. He ended up being an elder in the church that I pastored years later and he and I are good friends to this day. You see, when we bless others in our weakness, it isn't all about us anyway. It's all about the seed that we're planting and the seed is the word of God. That's what it's all about. And when the Holy Spirit can anoint us, even in our blundering, in our weakness, even in our mistakes, God's word is still powerful and his word can be breathed through us to bless others. I want to mention real quickly two things that don't impress God. I don't know if we've got a screen for this or not. Uh, comb overs and makeovers, <laughs> or comb overs and leftovers, I'm sorry. Two things that don't impress God. Now, if you've got a comb over, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to offend anyone. Uh, I'll probably have one someday, too. It's just one of those things where you try to hide the fact that you're challenged up there, okay? 
and, and you get in a big windstorm and everybody knows. <laughs> okay? I've described comb overs as flattery or shallow words or actions <clears throat> just to try to say, hey, you know, when it's not really from the heart, when we're trying to affirm someone and we don't really even mean it. God isn't impressed with that. God isn't impressed with fakery. Be real with people. Listen to them. Don't just throw out words and hope that they have an effect. Listen with your heart. Like I said earlier, God's word is powerful whether we're good at it or not. But let's not, be, let's not fall for this fakery stuff where we lay it on thick and it doesn't really even mean anything anymore. This lesson series is not about flattery. It's about building up people in the body of Christ with God-breathed Holy Spirit words that can affirm and build up Leftovers, this is a very important. God isn't impressed with comb overs. God isn't impre impressed with leftovers. I describe that as giving from our surplus instead of from our source. I've thought for a long time that it, the only way I could bless others is if I had a whole bunch of blessing myself. The only way I could give five bucks to this guy is if I had $1,000 in the bank myself. You know what? We can be more of a blessing with our little things than we can with the big stuff. Nobody is impressed. You know, Jesus told the story of the, the wealthy people who were throwing their money into the treasury and the disciples were watching and said, wow, did you see that? Did you see how much money he put in the offering? And then a lady came by and put in two mites. You know what Jesus said? She, in her poverty, has given more than all So, you see, it isn't us giving out of our abundance. It is, and it's all right if God has blessed us in that way. But it's us giving because we're connected to the source. We are channels of his blessing, and as it flows through us, we just have open hands and give it out to others freely. Freely you have received, freely give. So, today, this series, our mission, should we choose to accept it, is this. Threefold, reach, restore, and reproduce. Reach, restore, and reproduce. And, and I want to, I'm not going to go there this morning, but John chapter 4, we have some sermon groups that are meeting, and one of the questions that I have in, that, in the sermon study is about John chapter 4 and the woman at the well. And I'd like for you on your own time, maybe today or sometime this week, look at the story of Jesus with the woman at the well and see how he reached, how he restored, and how the gospel was reproduced in her. Uh, check that out in John chapter 4. It's a beautiful picture of what blessing others looks like, how we reach, restore, and reproduce. And, and I want to leave you with three challenges for this series in relation to reach, restore, and, and reproduce. Number one, allow God to stretch your reach. You're not going to like this, I promise you. You know how God usually stretches our reach? By adversity. Taking us places we wouldn't normally go by ourselves. That's how God usually stretches our reach. I've shared the story before, but I, and I won't take time to go into detail, but I still, I still recall when I was in North Dakota in the oil field at Christmas time and, and had just gone through my divorce and things were just really, really... Kind of, kind of bad. I was kind of, I was in a bad place, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and says, "I want you to have communion with the work guys up there in the man camp, Christmas, Christmas Eve communion." Can I tell? Can I be really crass here and tell you how the idea came to me? the The environment there was unbelievable. I was this Midwest Christian Christian boy preacher. And I was in the middle of oil field workers all of a sudden, and boy, was I in it for the shock of my life. And one guy, honest, I'm telling you the honest truth, he heard I was a preacher. He was one of the truck drivers up there. He said, oh, you're an effing preacher, huh? And he went on and on. He said, oh, I love to go to effing church. He says, I am even an effing Sunday school teacher. And he says, I really love it when they serve effing communion. I about dropped on the floor. 
<laughs> Wouldn't you? And, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me that day, and he said, he doesn't know any better. These guys are all here with the same hurts that you have. Why don't you have communion for these guys? I thought, wow, that's far out. I told you I was going to tell this story quick, but, you know, <laughs> kind of got sidetracked. Christmas Eve, I invited 80 guys in our man camp. I thought maybe two or three would show up. We'd have communion for 20 minutes and go home, and so I could tell the Lord I did my deed. I blessed these people. <laughs> 20 out of the 80 people showed up, 80, 20 out of the 80 guys. We were there for two hours, singing, praying, and crying together. They had families at home just like I did that they were missing. And they, they all had stories of some kind of a connection with God in the past. And because of something that happened at church or something that happened with somebody else, they had gone, they'd left God. And because of adversity, I found myself in a place to bless. And I didn't feel like it at all. But I want to tell you the reward of that to this day just, just warms my heart. How God can use us to bless even when we're at our worst. Allow God to stretch your reach. Pray this week. Lord, how can, you, how can you stretch my reach into an area where I haven't normally gone? Second, to restore, stop, look, and listen for the dreams in your neighbor so that God's dream in them can be restored. This is important, and they'll be, we'll be talking about this in the series later on, but listen to the hearts of others. They've probably had a dream that's been broken somewhere. And they need somebody to come along and bless them with words of hope and affirmation. Holy Spirit words. Listen for those opportunities. And third, engage in spiritual intimacy so that you can bring new life to dormant souls. My friends, the connection is up here. And if we ever lose this, if we ever lose connection with the, with the, the vine, we can't be fruitful in blessing others. So we're going to have a little bit of a worship time in a moment, but never forget. Never forget where our connection is. In fact, I'm going to ask Alan to come on up. I'm going to tell one last, I'm a storyteller, can you tell? I'm already three minutes over. This won't take long. You probably wondered why I have this jar of corn up here. When God called me into ministry about 20 years ago or 18 years ago or so, I was farming at the time. I loved it. I sold out of farming and I went to a minister school in Phoenix, Arizona, and we were supposed to go out on a mountain and we were supposed to listen to what God might say to us. And we were supposed to stake our claim in that mountain of what God spoke to us that day. And as I went up in the mountain, God, God, uh, I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I was, I was really kind of having second thoughts about leaving my, the life that I love to go into ministry. And, and I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, Phil, for every bushel of corn that you've ever grown, which was quite a lot, he says, you're going to touch that many people for, for, with eternal and kingdom consequences in the years to come. And I said, okay, Lord, I'll stake that claim. Kind of a, kind of a crazy dream, wasn't it? But God gave it to me. Years later, when I shipwrecked, I threw my jar away. I said, it's not going to happen again. I won't, I won't ever be effective in God's kingdom. All along, I'd kept this thing on my desk to remind me of the promise, of the dream. But I lost that dream. Sin, all kinds of things entered in there, and I lost it. And I still remember, oh yeah, I had plenty of people along the way to kind of reinforce that thing that I was done. But I remember walking into these doors in this auditorium and both Tom and Keith giving me Holy Spirit words that says God's not finished with you. God's not finished with ministry. And up until yesterday, this thing had never entered my mind. Last night in the rain, I went out to my brother's grain bin and I stole some corn. <laughs> And I put that jar back on my desk because I want to be reminded that God's dream in us is eternal. And I want to challenge us all not to be dream crushers, but to be dream builders and bless one another.
as the worship team comes and, say, and sings. I want to leave you with a blessing, and Tom is going to leave us with a parting blessing in a moment. But I would like to say this. As we part, may our hearts be warmed with the extravagance of our Father's love. May our ears be tuned to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. May our eyes be opened to the opportunities around us. And may our mouths breathe life into barren souls. <laughs>